language of games. Uh, I'm your host, Aviv. I'm the head of community and support, if you haven't seen me. Uh, and for the last 15 years, I've been studying, talking, and making games. Some of these are, are in Hebrew, so you won't understand. Um, but I have published several uh, tabletop role-playing games in Israel, and I have a gaming podcast, both in Hebrew and in uh, English. Uh, we'll have um, links to everything at the end. Uh, and I'm working on commercial video game releases as well, um, which has come out of my master's studies for game design development in Shankar. Um, so we are going to talk today about game literacy. And um, we are going to do that primarily th through examples from games. Um, I encourage you while I go over those examples and then talk about specific points to uh, either write in chat if you have anything to add or um, speak up and uh, we'll have a, a conversation. Um, I have my chat open. I don't see faces because Zoom is weird. So what is game literacy? Well, it's the language of games, but what are we talking about specifically? Um, well, those of you for, on this call that are part of uh, development and design and product will know that um, basically websites are built the same way and apps are built the same way. And why is that? It's because people become accustomed to uh, use programs the same way. Uh, we have menu bars and we have specific buttons and button states and the whole design systems are built around that. And games are the same. Uh, we have one added um, addition where games are not just around, well, more than one addition, but games are not just around the uh, visual design. Aviv, Aviv, sorry to interrupt. Can you make me yes. a book, please, so I can uh, admit uh, participant oh, in the waiting room? I, I, I didn't do anything. Aren't you the host? No, apparently not. So if you can just... Oh, uh, right. Um, make host. Yes. For some reason, I was the host. I don't know how to host. Okay, go ahead. Ooh. No worries. So yes, yeah, so games, we have visual design, which we'll talk about primarily in this side, uh, but we also have gameplay. We have interaction. That's what makes games, games. So uh, when we talk about the language of games, we talk about what we see and what we hear, of course, but we also talk about what we do. And there is sort of an adage for uh, game design and development about from cinema, we have this uh, axiom about uh, do, don't show, um, show, don't tell. Sorry, that's the other part. So show, don't tell, because in a movie or a TV show, we want, we want the audience to see what's happening and, and not tell them that what's happening. And with video games, we have the extended of that, do, don't show. And that means that the game should let the players do something instead of telling him them what to do. And that's where the game literacy came into that because games today expect people to know specific conventions. And well, oh yes, I, for, I forgot to, to say, there are resources in the, in the deck, we'll share the deck. I'm not going to go over the videos right now. That will be for your uh, entertainment and, and education later. Um, Game no, I don't games want you to play. Art. Thank you. Uh, design conventions. Design conventions are things that game use um, very often, and gamers uh, or players of games just know. We know that you press space or A to jump, and we know that you move from left to right in a, in a side-scrolling game. Uh, and we know a bunch of other things. For example, Oh, color. So if you are, uh, if you have red, green, color blindness, this next part is going to be difficult because games suck in that. Uh, we use red and green a lot. Please, everyone, mute and uh, don't bark in my ear. Thank you. Uh, Ronnie, now that you are uh, the host, you can also mute all, which will help. <laughs> 
Thank you. Uh, so yeah, so red and blue and green are colors that we use a lot and we use them for the same things always. So this is a screenshot from the tutorial of Star Renegades, a uh, game that came out uh, less than a year ago, sort of a um, uh, turn-based RPG roguelike. And um, they break here the rule of, of uh, uh, do, don't, sh don't, uh, don't show or don't tell even because they put a giant screen of text uh, before your eyes. But what they do do well uh, is color code everything you need. So you, we have health in red uh, and shields in blue. And then we have armor in yellow. Yellow is a very underrated color. Not a lot of uh, game uses it. And this will um, this will return over and over again in almost any game you can uh, you can look. Um, I choose I chose here Battle Chasers Night War, uh, and you can see health represented in green uh, and blue represented their, their energy. Now the role of red and green in games is weird because sometimes green is healthy and is good. Uh, and our health is, is green, and sometimes our health is red because red is the universal color for health, as we see in the colors of the Red Cross and the, uh, the Red Magen David, um, and, and all of the other um, healthcare uh, things that are red, and game uses that as well. But green will be used for healing for some reason or another. Um, now, another use for red and green, and again, I'm sorry for the color blindness, but uh, you, <laughs> you will see here uh, that we use uh, red and green for uh, sort of good and bad and also addition and subtraction. And uh, we have something or we don't have something. This is from God of War, uh, the latest one, 2018. Uh, you can see that when we have something exceeding um, the requirement is it in green. Also, green represents addition, uh, something being better than before. Um, and red is the lack of or subtraction. We don't have a subtraction in this screenshot, but you will believe me when I tell you that um, you will see this very often, uh, red being the, the negative numbers. And you can see here the, those, uh, th this very big, red message, uh, not enough resources, which will turn into something else when it's when we have enough resources. And I, I'm showing a specific um, specific example, but any gamer in the analyst will know that this is universal. We show additions in blue numbers, pluses. We show subtraction in red. We show uh, having something in uh, green or blue, a uh, lack of something in red, always red. Um, now, another very, very common use of color is the uh, indication of quality. Uh, now, if you're not very into gaming, there is a concept of items being better. Um, and uh, it, it can be items having uh, more stats or just having more things that they are able to do. But, but uh, if you take in the same point in the game, you take a blue item and a purple item, the purple will be better than the blue. This uh, is universal since 2014 when World of Warcraft made it universal. Before that, there was a few other color schemes, but once World of Warcraft came out, everyone aligned with uh, um, white, green, blue, Purple, orange, that's the color, uh, that's the scale for every game that came out after World of Warcraft. This is specifically for Godfall, a very new game. As you can see, um, when you get the deck, there is um, a color, uh, the, a link to TV Trope. I'm sorry I'm sending you to TV Trope. Don't uh, stay on the site for too long. Uh, well, you will say the, they talk about it and they give a bunch of examples. Um, so yeah, in, in uh, uh, Tal uh, brings up Diablo 2. In Diablo 2, there was a, a sort of a precursor to the World of Warcraft 
um, system. Uh, they had set items. Uh, yellow Dell was better than uh, than uh, purple or something like that. I don't even remember anymore. Um, but yeah, Diablo Diablo two had the, the that precursor thing. And then if you look at Diablo three, Diablo three aligned back with World of Warcraft, and that's the universal system now. Uh, you can see here in uh, Destiny as well, although uh, this particular character has only purple and yellow items. Uh, and as chat is um, uh, rightly stating, uh, if you ever hear uh, the, the talking about epics in video games, the epic item is always uh, purple. Um, and it uh, kind of loses its meaning where all of your items are purple, but that's how, how loot system works. Uh, that's what uh, you can do. Now, um, Shahar forced me to use Persona screenshots at least one time in this, uh, in this presentation. And I brought it here specifically to show you how it's subverted. Uh, and and that's because well persona 5 uh favors over um function basically uh the the green blue here is the health actually and not anything else and the red pink purple whatever color it is uh is the energy of the characters and and that's that's true for everything and that stems from the overall uh visual aesthetics of persona which is completely bonkers. Uh, it's one of those games where you either think it's the best stylized game in existence or the worst, depending where you fall. Um, well, I have a two of Persona uh, 5 on my arm, so I obviously fall into the, the camp of it's the best there is. Moving on. Oh, yes. Yeah. Now, this video is an amazing video and you should watch it after my, well, when you have time, we won't actually uh, watch it right now. How are games alike for someone who doesn't play games? There is a person that lives with his wife and his wife asked to try out some games and he did an experiment. He gave her a few different games with different genres to play without any input of his own. And he did a video essay on it, um, which is what prompted my, my presentation, actually. I talked about it in the podcast as well. It demonstrates magnificently how when you don't have that gaming literacy, uh, nothing is, is um nothing is, is clear from the beginning. I forgot the actual word I want to say. Uh, you need to learn everything from from the start. You 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 don't have any any preconceptions, um, and while intuitive, thank you, uh, and while games have tutorials, they still have specific preconceived notions that only gamers will know and non gamers won't know, and that's really interesting. Now, uh, a few years ago, I I I was always. A PC gamer used to uh, keyboard and mouse, and a few years ago I started um, playing with controllers, and they I, I, and then I bought consoles, and I had to play with controllers. And at first I had to look at the controller every time because I didn't instinctively know the location of the buttons. And that will be the same if you give a non-gamer a keyboard and tell them and tell them uh, you need to use the W, A, S, and D keys to move. For like normal person, what is that? What is W, A, S, and D? Yes, those are letters, but the, the, the connection between those letters and the arrow keys that we make and, and we have that for it, it's not, it's not uh, intuitive for anyone. So yeah, this is the video. Um, they talk in the video more about gameplay uh, than, than design, <clears throat> which I'm focusing here right now. Don't, no, don't. Let's move on. Two visual cues. Now, after we talked about design conventions, which are things um, most game do's in one form or the other, let's dive deeper, if you will, 
and we'll talk about visual cues. And that's how games use uh, visual design and aesthetics to hint at the player that there is something they need to do. And this screenshot is from Mirror's Edge Catalyst from uh, 2016. Is, um, you, you can see uh, something very clear in this picture, and that's the red. Now, um, those of you who are not familiar, Mirror Edge is a game where you do parkour, and that's the, the core of the game. And basically, the red shows you the places where you can go, what you can slide down, what you can jump over, etc. And white are usually the things that you walk on but can't do other things with. Now you look at it from this aerial perspective and you think, oh yes, this is clear, all the red, well, this wouldn't be so easy. But the game itself is played from first person perspective. So you only see like the immediate, like 200 meters before you and not all the levels spread out like that, which makes it really different. Now, oh yes, this is something we'll actually see. I couldn't find um, a screenshot of this, so I, I took I took uh, a GIF out of Co Carnage's uh, stream, and you can see that the area that you can climb on in The Witcher Three is marked as white. Now this is very pixely. I know. I'm sorry, but the um, can I go back? Yes. Unlike this very stylized, uh, well, style, <laughs> very stylized aesthetic that clearly shows you, well, the red pops out of the level. It, it, it has a quality to it that is very different from the rest of it. Um, here, there is sort of a, an effort to make the visual cues part of the rest of the aesthetics of the game. Now, if we go to the next example from Uncharted 2 uh, Among Thieves, you will see, yes, Borderlands 2, we'll get to that. I have a screenshot of Borderlands as well. Um, and uh, speaking of yellow, Uncharted 2, all three of the first Uncharted actually, use areas you can climb. Uh, Uncharted is also an example from the video I talked about before, because if you're a non-gamer and you get to those games and you see the yellow colored things, you will not make the immediate connection that yes, yellow is for climbing. Um, Borderlands uses yellow, um, Horizon Zero Dawn use yellow. In Horizon Zero Dawn is, is even more um, pathetic, not pathetic, but weird. Um, because you have like a giant robot dinosaur, and I don't have a screenshot of that, but believe me, you have a giant robot dinosaur uh, um, made amazingly, and then you have yellow bars all over it. And like you look at it and you know, yes, the yellow bars are the places I can climb. And the rest of it, no, I can't climb. Now, in Uncharted 4, they took the leap, and it was a great leap. If you look at the Uncharted 3 versus 4, also different consoles, I think. Uncharted 3 was on the PlayStation 3. Uncharted 4 was on the PlayStation 4. Much more graphical fidelity. And you can... Um, <clears throat> and you can look at this picture. And now I'm sure that if, if you look at this picture, and, and this is Nathan Drake, this is the player. This is, the, uh, this is my screenshot, I took this. Uh, and this is what you see in the game. So I'm sure you can see from this screenshot, even if you haven't played the game, you see that there are places here you can you can climb on, right? Those those uh, squares, uh, maybe the the hands of the clock, those squares, the um, the um, whatever you call it there below the window, etc. But they are actually looking like something. Uh, from ledges, thank you, Chase. Uh, they are actually seen as something from that building and are not colored yellow uh, to distract us and, and pull us out. Now, 
Uh, Tal is asking why does game studios decide to make it easier for the player? It's not about making it easier. It's about making it approachable. Um, and I will get to a point where we see that some games, in order to increase challenge, remove some of those hints. But first and for all, especially in a cinematic games like Uncharted, uh, you don't want the player to get stuck. You want them to understand the flow of the level in order for them to know how to get from point A to point B. Often it doesn't decrease the challenge. The challenge is not by... Uh, understanding that you can grab onto something is, is often by execution. Uh, Brian point, points out that yes, studios use behavioral data to, uh, to understand where is the fault points for those. What is, the, what is the balance between giving too much information and too few information uh, to the players? <laughs> uh, Borderlands, uh, chat <laughs> talked about it, specifically Borderlands 3. Yellow is the places you can climb. Um, Borderlands 3 specifically has a lot of more vertical uh, inclination than the previous Borderlands. There are a lot of er er yellow areas there. Uh, this is a, a picture, um, a screenshot from um, Dark Side of Genesis, something I'm playing right now, also my screenshot. Uh, and I, I guess you can see beyond all this red of the hellscape that there are specific places that are tinted blue. And this are, those are the specific places you can climb, not anywhere else. Now, you look at it like that, yes, it's weird, but again, it's a, it's a question of execution and not like realizing where you need to go. The, the, the moment a player asks himself where I need to go and does, doesn't have an answer, it's one of the most frustrating thing in any game. And, and game developers want, want to eliminate that feeling. If you are sitting in front of your monitor or TV and you are looking at the game and you don't know what to do next, it's a failure of game design. And a game developer doesn't want to reach there at any point. So. Uh, they balance out what's, uh, what to do about it. Um, Doom Eternal, also the, the, the Doom before that, uh, this is not about climbing things, although this game has things to climb. Green donates things you can interact with. Uh, in this, in this uh, instance, you can punch, and you can see that the symbol also uh, donates like a, 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 um, a punch, so you can punch it. Uh, so that's another example. Uh, and that's it for, for this section about visual cues. Now in the next section, we'll go level deeper. And we talked about how those same visual cues and aesthetics encourage specific gameplay mechanics and behavior. So this is um, a screenshot from The Long Dark. And I don't have the specific one I needed because I couldn't find any, but in this game, uh, this is a survival game. Let me preface, uh, not many people will know it probably. Uh, as you can see, uh, you are in a, in a arid frozen landscape uh, and you need to survive and you, you need to gather food and water and, and sometimes medicine and, uh, and, and not die basically. Uh, and one of the ways the game uh, tell you that there are sources of food around is by birds. And the birds will circle around points of, well, carcasses on the ground because that's how birds work in, in real life as well. So this is, we are passing from the realm of just the gamey visuals and into the realm of more immersive design because, uh, well, I look at the birds and I will say to myself, okay, it's, it's, it's logical that there are birds here. Um, and I will think about maybe the birds are a sign. Uh, there, is a, there is a very long time debate among Skyrim fans about treasure foxes. I just saw an article uh, this week. Um, People are claiming that when you see a fox in Skyrim, it leads you to treasure. 
and other people are, are claiming it's not true. I don't know the answer, but that's another good example of using uh, design elements, specific visuals or specific acts in the game to prompt the player to do something. Uh, this is the classic one of all. Uh, it came from the Batman series of game, actually the outcome, but this is Spider-Man. Uh, I love this game. Uh, this is also my screenshot. Uh, and here you can see the Spidey sense uh, tells Spider-Man that uh, somebody is shooting him. Uh, and so you need to dodge. Uh, so there is a visual indicator of something happening in the game and the player, which uh, is explained in the tutorial, knows that they need to dodge. Now, this also connects very, very well with the Spider-Man uh, mythos, if you uh, can call it like that, um, because, well, fans of, of Spider-Man that will play this game know about Spider-Sense, uh, and this visual is the same visual as in the comics. They took the same visual from the comics, connected it to the game, uh, and put it here uh, in order to signal that something is dangerous and you need to do something about it. Uh, this is a, a screenshot from Star Wars uh, Jedi Fallen Order, a great game. Uh, and you will notice that there are lines on the side of the cliff. Now, I'm sure that if I told you nothing, those lines will look like part of the scenery. Uh, we have this giant alien dragon and, and some sort of, of loot crate here and a person with a lightsaber and whatnot. And then we have a cliff with, with moss and everything. And the, the cliff has scrapes, scrapes of a different color that unlike the, the um, examples we saw in the previous sections, they, are, they look exactly like something you will find on a cliffside. But in reality, they, they are uh, uh, a cue um, for the players to act. And this specifically is a wall run. Uh, a wall run mechanic. You, the player knows that where they see those scrapes on the well, they can wall run across the wall. And if they are not, uh, Alex in chat says the Skyrim Foxes were confirmed. Well, that's another chapter in the, in the mystery. Maybe, I don't know, kind of confirmed. Uh, we'll, we'll, keep, uh, we'll keep thinking about that mystery. Um, Tal says that was map making um, for Fallen Order. That's true. The maps are extremely confusing in their generality, but the specific element they placed on the map there are places, it's very clear where you can use your specific powers once you get there. Um, the, the, the challenge is to get there. Um, now, this is a different thing about aesthetics, um, marrying mechanics, and this is Slate Spire, a very recommended uh, roguelike card game. Uh, you will notice a few things. First of all, I have this energy thing here, and it's it's red, and I also have a red card, probably connected to one another, right? And then we also have the the, the cards uh, with uh, with a blue outline. Uh, this is not a good screenshot. I should have brought a, a screenshot where some of the cards were blue outlines, some not, but the blue outline um, marks cards that can be used because we have enough of this energy mana thing. And we also have a different kind of um, mana here that is obviously different. Color. Now I'll get you back to design conventions. Uh, something with a plus is green, for example. Uh, the, obviously the, the health is red as well as the health here. Um, and that's, uh, that, that's that for, for this thing. Portal. In this case, Portal 2, because I didn't find a very good screenshot otherwise, uh, one of the masterpieces of marrying designs with mechanics. There are a few things you will see uh, in Portal. Uh, and Portal also um, teaches the player how to do things without ever speaking and without ever writing a single word. Uh, well, 
there are speaking, there, there is speaking, but usually speaking uh, serves to taunt you in Portal and not really help you. So that's a thing. Uh, Portal uses uh, symbolism a lot in order to help you progress through it. Uh, and the most, well, two no most notable things about design in Portal is, first of all, the colors of the, of the portals. Uh, we don't see the other side of the portal, but in Portal, the portals are orange and blue. Um, obviously, coming back to orange-blue contrast, that's something that's very strong in any uh, visual, visual design. Uh, movie posters often use uh, blue and orange. Um, a lot of it going on. So blue and orange and, and as two sides of compatible but distinct um, Also in portal, um, white or gray surfaces, as you can see here, and also on the wall, um, are places when you can fire portals and open them, uh, unlike black surfaces, where you can't, and that's a, a design convention that is um, kept along all of the portal, um, both games and, and stuff, and also to the like um, spin of games and, and stuff like that. A very strong game about conventions without actually having like very strong uh, UI or anything. It just teaches you specific conventions in in the in the core of its gameplay. One of the perfect examples of of uh, do don't show. Um, another very good game for do don't show is Immortals: Phoenix Rising. Uh, one of the things that this game does with color is use color for enemy strength, not only. Um, not only item rarities and stuff like that, but you will see that this enemy is blue and this enemy is red. And the blue enemies are uh, easier uh, to, to kill than red enemies. And there are also purple enemies that are the tough, the, the most tough normal enemies. And there are sort of white, uh, pink enemies that are legendary enemies. Uh, and, and the game doesn't tell you any of this. When you start the game, on the first area of the game, you only have blue uh, enemies. And then if you start exploring around and you go into the places you shouldn't go, you find, suddenly find red enemies and they're tough and they will kick your ass. Sorry, but um, so you, you probably find it by mistake. Uh, and as you level up, some of the blue enemies will turn into red and then they will turn into purple. Uh, Etc. Again, another game uh, that is excellent and, and the do don't tell um, school, very uh, excellent puzzles. And this is what I alluded to earlier, and we talked about difficulty. Uh, this is um, the difficulty selection screen from Shadow of the Tomb Raider. And one of the things you will see here is no white paint on critical paths. Reduce uh, wrap type, that doesn't matter. But they take the convention we talked about uh, for painting uh, areas you can do something with and integrate it into the difficulty system. If you want a harder challenge, we can remove that paint. And then you will have to figure yourself uh, it yourself um, how to do it. Uh, the game also has a, a mechanical survival instinct and in survival instinct, it paints the level in specific colors uh, for points of interest and you can turn it. So back to the questions that, the question that we had before, uh, yes, some of those design elements can make it's easier for the player, has a more approachable uh, player experience. But if you want that challenge, you can remove it in some games, not all of them. Let's talk about a specific use case of uh, design aesthetics. Diegetic design. Uh, this is a screenshot from Dead Space. I'm sorry about the horrible zombie. Well, Necromorph. Uh, and one of the things you will see here, and um, 
which we are we call the agetic uh, interface, is that the character has everything that has to do with the gameplay on the model itself. Uh, instead of having like a health bar and an ammo counter and an energy bar, it's all on the suit. Now, what is diegetic design? If you're not familiar with the word, diegetic is, is when an element is presented in the game or movie or media world, uh, and it's part of it instead of coming uh, from outside for the audience. So for a movie, in a, for example, uh, you hear music in, in a movie and the character, that, they, they don't hear that music, that the music is just for the audience. That's a non uh element. Now, if you think about Guardians of the Galaxy, all the music in Guardian of the Galaxy comes from Peter's Quill, either Walkman or cassette tape in the um, in the Milano, in the in the spaceship. So all the music is part of the movie universe of the world itself. The characters themselves listen to the music. This is especially um, especially uh, emphasized in Guardians Two where they are fighting in the beginning, they are fighting the giant alien and Groot um, is dancing to the sound of, of uh, Mr. Blue Sky um, while they are fighting. The diegetic music. Diegetic music is the most common form of diegetic design in cinema and television because it's also the easiest. Now in, in video games, um, basically the... Uh, well, there are sometimes diegetic music as well, um, contrary to like normal OST. But the mo- the thing that all is non gamey, uh, non uh, sorry, non non um, non immersive the most is usually the UI. We have strange elements on our screen that the character does don't see. They don't know how how much health they have. They don't know. Uh, well, they will know how much bullets they have, but maybe not the precise amount or whatever. So games like Dead Space takes all of these uh, design elements and puts them in the game. Now, it's a bit of a hit or miss there since I don't see my back. I can't actually see the health meter I have on my back. It's clearly there for the player, sorry. It's clearly there for the player because of the third person camera. So it's not for the for the character in the game. They don't see their, their health. They don't see their energy. They do see their ammo, maybe. So, um, so, so sort of no here, no there. Uh, now, both Firewatch, a great game, and uh, Far Cry 2 uh, do this a bit with the uh, with the map. So uh, in, a, in a regular game, you will pull the map screen and you have a map screen and it's sort of, again, for the player, uh, the characters may have some sort of map, but it's certainly not the interactive map you are presented with. So in, uh, in Firewatch, the, the map not only is a physical object you are holding in your hand, as well as the compass, uh, whenever you find something new, the character actually re- writes on the, on the map making it all the more immersive. And that's actually a very good use of, of jet, diegetic design because while well, the map is something the characters actually uses, uh, unlike um, Dead Space where it doesn't make sense that the character will look to the back for the health, whatever. Um, Far Cry 2 does sort of half a job because all the, like you see yourself actually moving while in a in a true diegetic map you wouldn't because there is, there is no way to mark yourself in real time whatever uh, but those are the reasons diegetic diegetic design is is not very common uh, because there is no it's very difficult to do well and uh, it's very easy to watch um, a video about diegetic design you should watch it. <laughs> And my next topic, and I see that I'm very good on time, uh, my last topic, about a bit about technical design. I'm going to, to uh, step here into some of the things that makes a game tick. And first of all, we need to understand, this is Overwatch, by the way, we need to understand what is a collider. 
This is Unreal Engine 4, uh, one of the two most popular game engines on the planet, free to use. Um, and you can see this is the um, demo scene that comes with the engine for a third person perspective game. And this is the character you play in the scene. And it's in, it, it is encapsulated by a red capsule. What is this red capsule? Well, it's the collider. What is a collider? The collider is the thing in every game, in, in any game engine that is actually interacting with all the elements of the, of the world, of the game world. Uh, when you see this visual, the game engine itself doesn't run on those models um, or those... There are invisible boxes and spheres that the game engine does all of its mathematical equations and calculations on. And it can produce a fairly, um, well, amusing results sometimes. So in Overwatch, and, and that's, uh, that's the example that prompts me to bring it here, there was a very uh, public um, kerfuffle around the hitboxes of characters in Overwatch. What is the hitbox? Is the area of the character that if I shoot with my weapon at, uh, will register a hit. Now, the hitboxes in, in any game are larger the, than the model itself because it's hard hitting the model exactly. If we go back to the discussion about why make a game easier? Um, it's not about making the game easier, it's making the game fun because people want to actually hit people. And uh, unless you are some super sniper, if we make the hit boxes or the colliders oh, off uh, mute. No. <laughs> uh, if, you, if you make the hit boxes, the colliders of the characters exactly on the characters themselves, it greatly reduced the enjoyment of the game. So um, any first person, third person action game, any game at all needs to balance the um, sizes of the hitbox. If you make them too big, the game, well, first of all, be too easy, but also will act weird um, and stuff like that. If you make them too small, again, too hard, and will act weird again. So um, this is a link to um, after after the the kerfuffle with uh, with Overwatch um, hitboxes being too big, uh, people start paying very close attention. Uh, yes, th those looks like olives. Uh, people start paying very close attention to the the hit sizes in Overwatch. Uh, and there is a, a, a project, the Hitbox Playground, where people like pulse the files of the game and uh, makes visualization of the actual hitboxes. Um, and uh, people that play Overwatch competitively, it's very important to them to, them to know the, the, that information. Uh, you will see the red here specifically is for, is for the headshots. Uh, which are calculated differently than normal um, normal hitboxes. Now, going back like 40 years ago, well, 30, uh, this was also a thing, uh, as I said, the, the concept of colliders is uh, with us from uh, for every uh, game engine. And uh, this was also true at the very beginning of the the graphic adventures. This is a screenshot from Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade by, by LucasArts, uh, which I, I took because the Pixel Hunt page uh, points specifically to that game. Now, very similarly to uh, Overwatch and other 3D games, if your hitbox is too small, it's very difficult to, to hit things and then you are frustrated. And those, well, those graphical adventures, point and click, as, as their name suggests, were meant for pointing at things and clicking on them. And sometimes um, they made the 
items you need to click on very, very small, uh, which uh, gave birth to the concept of pixel hunting, because sometimes the area you, could, you needed to hit was uh, the size of a single pixel, making this very, very frustrating. This is it for my talk. Uh, we'll have 10 minutes for questions. Why I nailed this time. Uh, those are my links. This is all the games uh, we talked to. Uh, and then um, those are recommended YouTube channels. Uh, questions, comments, uh, firing galleries. Um, the, the, the stage is for the audience at this point. And now I can go back to actually seeing people. So, any other questions? Yes, we'll share the recording, we'll yeah, share the I presentation. I'll um, later on today, Tomer. Now, uh, we only covered like 25 different games. I could have uh, brought uh, like three times the examples for some of those things. And obviously there's a lot to talk about, uh, about game literacy. It's a very, very big topic, uh, but I hope that some of those examples uh, were of interest to you. Uh, games that do a bad job. Well, uh, I brought the old, um, <laughs> The old uh, graphical point and click is, is one example for pixel hunting. Um, it's, it's tough to, uh, we actually, okay, I'll, I'll preface that. In order to prepare for this talk, I asked on Facebook on, on uh, the Working Gamer Israeli uh, Gaming Group, for examples for both sides, I wanted to bring also a bad examples of um, design and mechanics. Um, but surprisingly, there are very few examples of those, um, of, of designs that hinders mechanics, because at the end, even if they don't do amazing work with design uh, because of game literacy, the game is still playable. Uh, the places where it usually starts falling apart is um, if the mechanics themselves don't um, not connecting with the with the gameplay with the player, uh, and where the story of the game doesn't connect with the gameplay, what we call the ludo um, ludo narrative dissonance. Now there are games that have have very few overt graphical uh, aesthetic um, uh, aesthetic uh, um, cues and and stuff like that, and uh, we can bring the uh, Souls, the um, series, as an example, they actually use lights a lot to uh, to bring focus on people and, uh, on on specific elements instead of uh, visual cues. Well, <laughs> instead of other visual cues, light is still visual. Um, so stuff like that. Uh, I the, the things we talked about here are the most common. Uh, there are other um, methods, obviously. Uh, thank you for all the GZs. I am not familiar with Warzone, so if, it, if they do um, uh, if they do a, a bad job, I don't know about it. Um, Chase asked if the tabletop games I created is available in English. No, sorry. I do have a game that is available to download in English uh, on my itch page. Any other questions? Yeah, we, the timing was great. Yeah, you were great, Aviv. <laughs> I think we should schedule additional talk to cover more topics. You give me, give me like a month to, <laughs> to, to, to prepare for that. Okay, uh, if you have any other questions, you can always talk to me on Slack, on Twitter or whatever. You will have the uh, recording, you will have the deck. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and we can talk about other things. <laughs> uh, so thank you and have a very good rest of your day. Thank you so much, Aviv. Bye-bye. Thank yeah, you, Aviv. Thank Bye. you. Thanks, Aviv. Bye.